Incoming transmission. Welcome. 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 Welcome to True Spies. Week by week, mission by mission, you'll hear the true stories behind the world's greatest espionage operations. You'll meet the people who navigate this secret world. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? This is True Spies. I have a story that occurred over 30 years ago during the U.S. invasion of Panama and the capture of General Manuel Noriega, the dictator of the country. And I was instrumental in getting Noriega out of the papal nuncio. This is True Spies. Episode 99, Catching Noriega. It's the 20th of December, 1989. George Bush has just launched Operation Just Cause. In other words, the US has invaded Panama. The US had enjoyed a close relationship with Panama, and in particular, its de facto leader, General Manuel Noriega. But the relationship between the two countries had deteriorated to the point of no return. The US wanted Noriega gone. More than 20,000 American troops invaded Panama, seizing control of key military installations. Panama City became a battleground. The US planned to extradite General Noriega from Panama to face charges in the US. There was just one problem. He completely disappeared. When he did finally surface, it was under the protection of the Vatican Embassy in Panama City, meaning US forces could not legally enter the building to seize him. No matter what they tried, they could not get him out. What you're about to hear is a story that's been hidden for over 30 years. It's the story of how Martha Duncan, a Panama analyst in the Joint Intelligence Fusion Cell, changed the course of history by persuading General Manuel Noriega to surrender to US forces. I think that was achieved because I was a woman, because there were parts to this whole operation that entailed getting close to a mistress that another man is not going to have the same opportunity. Panama, capital, Panama City. Size, 29,157 square miles. Languages, Spanish, English. Major religion, Christianity. Leader, General Manuel Noriega. Nicknamed Pineapple Face, not a pretty man on the outside or the inside. A brutal dictator, a lover of parties, a drug trafficker, arms dealer, and allegedly an electoral fraudster and murderer to boot. In spite of all that, Noriega had once enjoyed a special relationship with the US. He was a key ally in Washington's attempts to battle the influence of communism in Central America. But now, that relationship had failed utterly. Noriega had himself declared war on the US. Likewise, the Americans were unhappy with his criminal activities and were already planning his downfall. The final straw came when Panamanian forces killed an American serviceman. The US declared war. It was a clear, clear evening. You know, all the stars were visible and all of a sudden, the sky just lit up. The sound of bombs, the sound of gunfire. It was the most surreal sound you will ever, ever hear. Very, very chaotic. Meet Martha Duncan. She was the Panama analyst at the US Defense Intelligence Agency. But crucially, Martha is from Panama. 
I was born in the former canal zone. This is an area that's 10 miles wide and about 50 miles long. And it's called an incorporated territory, which the United States leased from Panama. And all that were born within that territory are called Zonians. So, so I am a Zonian. The Panama Canal Zone came into being in 1903. It was a home away from home for the Americans who built and maintained the canal and the workers who supported them. Martha grew up sporty, was a good student, and having links to the US through her father, went to college there. But she was drawn back to Panama when her studies ended. In 1977, she got a job back in the canal zone as a sports director working with the US military. She staged tournaments with the Panama Defense Forces Noriega's security unit and the US military. It was during one of these tournaments that she was approached by a US military intelligence officer. The offer he made would change Martha's career from sports instructor to spy. In 1978, at one of these tournaments, the commander of the 470th Military Intelligence Battalion approached me one day and, and asked if I was interested in changing career fields. And I asked him why he would think that. And uh, he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm the commander of the military intelligence battalion. I've seen you, how you handle yourself through all of these sporting events, your translations, because I had to translate a lot of these sporting activities, Spanish to English was really perfect. You have a master's degree, you have a great personality. And I just was wondering whether you would be interested in transitioning into a different field. She said yes. By now, you know how the recruitment dance goes. She was interviewed by two agents in a darkened hotel room and faced a battery of tests. Then, nothing. For years, Martha heard nothing from her would-be recruiters. She put aside any idea of working in intelligence. She moved on. In 1980, she got a job in the US as a youth activities director for the military. Then, out of the blue, she gets a call. And it was from an office out of Fort Meade. And, <laughs> and it was funny because it's been so long. The individual asked if I was still interested in the intelligence field. So yes, I said, I'm interested. And uh, in June of 1982, I drove to Fort Meade, Maryland, and uh, I was assigned to a unit called Special Operations Detachment. And that really was the first day of my intelligence career. Martha began to learn the tradecraft of military intelligence. The training that I had was, was pretty intense and diverse. I attended a training course in England that focused on surveillance detection, uh, setting up operating posts, the conducting of surveillance, escape and evasion, all of the things that are, are required when you really are in a scenario where you're being followed or you're following somebody. When I returned back to special operations, after some time, my boss approached me about going into additional training in the clandestine world. So I went to the farm, which focuses on every possible aspect for a clandestine officer that's facing the acquisition of a foreign agent, which involves different techniques, methods, you know, how to be involved with your agent, your source, how to train them, all of the various trade crafts necessary for uh, the conduct of a clandestine operation. She had graduated into the spy business. Martha was assigned to a special operations unit within the Department of Defense. And in 1989, was promoted to Panama analyst for the Central American branch within the Defense Intelligence Agency. So when the US wanted a team to go to Panama ahead of the US invasion, Martha's name was put forward. In many ways, she was the perfect choice. She was athletic, had excellent language skills and knowledge of the region, 
and was trained in spy skills and counterintelligence operations. Sounds like they had the perfect spy for the job, no? But there was one problem. They were expecting a man. When my boss got me out of class and uh, asked me to be a part of a special unit to go to Panama, he said it was a very important mission because it was a very specialized unit to go after Noriega. It was a very difficult selection for him. I did not know this at the time, but he was being asked by the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency that he better have his stuff together because if something went wrong as a result of selecting a woman for the job, his job was on the line. Martha wanted to go. In fact, she really wanted this gig. For me, it was a very, very personal decision. And, and, I, and it was a decision because my boss at the time that I was selected for the team asked me if I wanted to go. And, and I remember thinking, what a proud moment. Yes, I want to be part of a team to take Noriega out of there. I, I was just so excited to go and be part of this. You know, I, I didn't look at it at the time that, that I was part of history making or anything like that that was to come, but I certainly wanted to be part of an effort to get Noriega out of there. It was very personal, you know, that was my, my homeland. That's where I had grown up. Uh, and I had a lot of family in Panama that was, was feeling, you know, the pinch of, of, of Noriega's involvement in, in so many aspects of life. I did not think of myself as I'm a woman going down there. I just felt I'm being selected because I have the right tools and ability to be part of the team. So I did not look upon this as anything other than I'm on orders to could do my, my duty. Finally, Martha was given the all clear. She could go. But it was made implicit that if she messed up, heads would roll back in Washington. And so Martha became part of Operation Blue Spoon, an advance operation to prepare the country for the invasion. Crucial to this was the ability to track General Noriega. The US wanted to ensure that once the troops invaded, they could quickly capture him and bring him to justice. So our team arrived Panama in uh, November on a C-130 military transport into Howard Air Force Base. And then we were set up in the tunnel, which is up in Quarry Heights. And that's where the senior command operations post was set up. And each member of the team had their specific specialty and they executed that on a daily basis. My background as a case officer and being from my native country, I knew the surroundings and I had a good appreciation of the people. She knew this place. She belonged, blended in, and she knew she could use that to her advantage. So one of the first things that I started doing was going into, into town and, and talking with the folks on the street. And I blended very well. We had uh, also set up the operational element where I had a telephone and a desk assigned to me up, up in the tunnel. Martha's job was to gather intel on the whereabouts of General Noriega. I had set up a hotline so that people could uh, phone in and, and provide information of where Noriega might be. Imagine, you worked abroad for a while. While you've been gone, you've learned a few new skills. You know, surveillance, espionage, military counterintelligence training, standard. Now you're back, and the future of the country is at stake. Where on earth do you start? Part of my responsibility, I thought, was to really get to know the reaction, the sentiments of the people. And uh, I would go downtown, and I blended in quite well into the commercial areas, into the shops, just to hear people talking because that was really the talk of the moment anyway. There was a lot of activity by U.S. military forces with 
helicopters and training operations and things that they were doing as part of the exercises. So there was a lot of uh, commotion, you know, that was going on on a daily basis. Right. One of the most important tools of tradecraft, talking and listening. Oh, and flirting. I would chat them up, see what their sentiments were. I also would do my my running out at the Fort Amador Causeway, which was something that I used to do when I was back in high school, an area that I really enjoyed. And I would put my shorts on and, and just run down the causeway. And Noriega had special units that were located on the causeway. So uh, I would run down there and, and stop and chat up with the guards, really flirting, asking how the boss is doing and report any information that they may give me. We were really interested to see what the activities of Noriega were, you know, at that point. It was on one of those visits to the city that Martha decided to get her hair and nails done at a salon downtown. Were the doubters right? Was Martha taking her eye off the job? No, of course not. Martha knew exactly what she was doing. That visit to the salon would ultimately lead to one of the momentous events in recent U.S. history, the surrender of General Manuel Noriega. I went to a a hair salon that was known to be frequented by uh, Miss Vicky Noriega's mistress, and I thought that I would uh, obtain some information from the gals there. So I went to have my hair and my nails done, see what I can find out. And the chat there was really, Miss Vicky was very despised. You know, she had come from a, a respected family. And once she got tied in with Noriega, she forgot about her roots and just enjoyed the lavishes and the riches that Noriega provided. She would go to the salon and uh, the gal would tell me that, you know, as much money that she probably has, she was not a good tipper and she was not a blonde, which I found to be interesting. but. That's the kind of talk that you're going to find in a salon. We've all been there, the barbers or the hairdressers. People talk, they gossip. And if you're a trained spy, you listen. So Martha picked up intel on Noriega's mistress, Vicky Amado. Vicky is important because she was known to be with him on social occasions and official visits. If anyone would know where Noriega was and what he was doing, it was the mistress. Whilst getting a coat of nail polish and a fresh blow dry, Martha also discovered more information that could help her get closer to Noriega. I also found out that Vicky's mother had a little bar restaurant and she was known to cook the meals for Noriega because she was concerned about poisoning. So Vicky's mother would do the meals for Noriega. Martha was building up a picture of Noriega and also of the women in his life information that the usual intel routes wouldn't pick up. As we've mentioned, it was important that the US keep tabs on Noriega. Capturing him in the event of an invasion was a top priority. And so on the 19th of December, 1989, US troops invaded. The US had tired of Noriega's increasingly repressive role internally in Panama. And there were indications he was selling his services to other intelligence bodies not to mention drug trafficking organizations. They wanted him out. As soon as the invasion started, the plan was to capture Noriega and extradite him to face justice for his drug charges. There's one problem. Noriega had disappeared. When the invasion occurred, Noriega had been attending meetings on the Atlantic coast. They had tracked him to a hotel outside of Tacuman Airport prior to the invasion. When the invasion did occur, the guns went off. It was chaos, you know, it was just fire bombings and and infantry just all over the town, all over the country, really. And in that chaos, the elements that had been uh, tracking Noriega's move lost Noriega. He disappeared from the hotel where he had last been seen. Martha's hotline lit up. 
There were multiple calls to my hotline about sightings, people explaining that they had seen him in a particular location. I would relay this information to the reconnaissance and search team that was also co-located up at the tunnel. And uh, they were then given an order to go search that particular location because really nobody knew where he had gone. By December the 21st, the US military and intelligence agencies had lost track of him. Nobody knew where he was. Was he in the jungle, the mountains? Where had he fled to? It was my feeling that Noriega was not in the mountains or, you know, in the jungles. I just had a sense that, you know, his love for Miss Vicky had to factor in to perhaps where he may be located. Call it a hunch. Call it feminine intuition. Whatever it is, she sets to work, using all her tradecraft. She's highly trained. Her whole career has been building to this moment. Of all her skills, surveillance, counterintelligence, espionage, weapons training, which one would aid her best in the pivotal moment? So I got the yellow pages, and looked up the Amado family, and I made a phone call. Ah, of course, the yellow pages. I thought that that phone call would tell me if Vicky knew where Noriega was just based on the emotions that I would hear on the other side. So when I made the call, uh, her mother, Norma, answered the phone and I introduced myself as Maria and I had a message from Manuel for Vicky. At that moment, Norma just screamed for Vicky and uh, Vicky comes to the phone, she's out of breath and the first question that she asks is, is he okay? Where is he? So, you know, (laughs) that was the moment that I just knew that these two ladies were clueless as to Noriega's whereabouts. Oh, so much for hunches. Martha is no closer to Noriega, but that didn't deter her. She knew Vicky was the key to unlocking the location of the most wanted man in Panama. Martha didn't give up. I told Miss Vicky that my name was Maria and I had a message from Manuel that he was very, very concerned about her safety. He was fine, but he was more concerned about her safety. And if she was afraid, then call me back, Maria, and I would take her to safety. Ah, another well-known tradecraft technique, the barefaced lie. I provided a phone number for her to return a call And that's where I left it on the evening of the 21st. On the 23rd of December, three days after the hunt to find Noriega began, Martha, now going by the name Maria, gets the call. It had worked. Vicky was scared and accepted Maria's offer to get her to safety. They agree to meet. They arrange bona fides. I had mentioned to her that I would pick her up, provided her the bona fides of what she should be wearing, and I would drive up to her, just introduce myself as Maria, and for her to get in the vehicle quickly. Bona fides? You know, the identifying details, so Vicky knew she could trust the person who was in the car, was the one she'd agreed to meet. One problem. Maria did not have any transport. No car. The operations environment was was really happening so quickly that I did not have uh, opportunity to say, I need a vehicle, you know, let's call the motor pool, let's get me a, a civilian sedan. You know, I knew that I just had to react quickly and have a vehicle that would blend in with where I was going. And so I came up with the idea of contacting a a friend that I knew about borrowing his car. It was a 1968 Chevy Impala, and the name was the Dogmobile because the car was only used to transport his German Shepherds around. So (laughs) it was perfect really for what I needed. You know, old beat up car and going into a part of town that you didn't see fancy sedans, and so that's the automobile that that I used to uh, 
go pick up Miss Vicky. Dogmobile. Not exactly James Bond's Aston Martin, but it does the trick. Blends in perfectly. Now for the pickup. When I rolled the window down, I said, I'm Maria. She quickly got into the car. As I looked at her face, you know, she's a little taller than I was. So about 5'5", five, five. clear eyes, pretty eyes, shoulder length hair, and it was <laughs> blondish color. And I remembered, you know, in the salon that she's really not a blonde, but, you know, that's women talk. But uh, she was an attractive lady. Then I proceeded to take another surveillance route back to the safe house. And there was just quiet in the car. It was really somewhat profound. Martha, as Maria, hadn't actually lied. She was taking her to a safe house. She just not yet told her the safe house was in fact a US military base. She was very nervous. And as I drove into the canal zone is when I can sense that she looked at me and, and asked where we were going. Because at this point I was now approaching a military guard you know, checkpoint with the US of course at this point. And uh, I told her that I was taking her to safety and that she should no longer be alarmed. Now the interrogation begins, but this isn't your average intelligence interview. No lie detectors here. Martha knew Vicky was the key to Noriega's whereabouts. She knew what to do. She applied some very unusual techniques. You won't find these in the handbook of spy training. Listen well. The uh, start of the interrogation really goes to her arrival, making her feel that she was safe. Uh, when she went to her bedroom, closed the door and, and, and gave her some time just, just to be alone. I heard her crying in there. You know, later in the evening, I, I knocked on the door and I, I said, you know, I, I had some dinner for her. So it's all part of how the interrogation process begins. It's building the rapport getting to know this woman a little bit better, having her feel that she can confide in me more. So it was uh, talking a lot about her own beginnings, her family. She had two brothers, had been married, but it was uh, a tragic end to her marriage when her husband died in an automobile accident and she had a young child. She did come from a respectable family, you know, and, and she was educated and she wanted good things for her family. Martha had to be Vicky's friend, Bill Trust. Would this woman give up her lover? More importantly, Martha was Panamanian. How could she hide her contempt and disgust for the woman who had sold out her country for personal gain, living a life of luxury when most people lived in poverty? Well, my, my personal feelings were really disdain. I just looked at a woman that was a very attractive woman, you know, from a good family. And I just thought to myself, how can she be with somebody who is just despised by the country? You know, the things that he had done to get Panama where it was at that particular point. How could she do this? And I asked her, I said, do you think that he really did good things for the country? And she didn't answer me, but I could tell just by her look that she was embarrassed. You know, she was really not sure that she wanted to answer that question because, you know, he did not do good for the country. He did good for himself. And she took advantage of being, you know, his mistress and being lavished upon. Putting her own feelings aside, Martha focuses on the woman in front of her. She knows where her Achilles heel is and she puts that knowledge to use. I did mention to her that because of her involvement with Noriega, uh, her own future could be in jeopardy. The future of her children could be in jeopardy in terms of uh, perhaps wanting to send them to the United States for education or medical reasons, you know, visas would not be approved, uh, you know, and, and from a legal standpoint, there could be something that would jeopardize her own life, really, because of her association with him. So it really behooved her to cooperate with the U.S. government because 
doing that would prevent her from being in more problems uh, than she expected. Meanwhile, whilst his mistress is being interrogated, on December the 24th, 1989, Christmas Eve, the missing Noriega, facing a US indictment for drug trafficking, as well as claims of election rigging, walks into the Vatican's embassy in Panama City and claims protection. Now the US knew where he was, but getting him out was another matter. Let's just pause a moment. Did you spot the dates? Noriega walks into the Vatican Embassy in Panama City one day after Vicky meets Martha, or Maria, and is taken to the safe house at the US base. Had Noriega heard where his love was being held? Was that what lured him out? We'll never know. While Martha was interrogating Vicky, the US Army tried their own tactics. They decided to use psychological warfare by blasting a wall of sound non-stop outside the Vatican Embassy. Courtesy of a playlist from the Southern Command Network, the US military radio in Central America, a fleet of Humvees mounted with loudspeakers rolled in. And rock music rolled out. The Clash, Van Halen, Guns N' Roses, The Doors. Added to the noise were protesters outside banging pans. There were frantic calls to the archbishop inside the embassy asking him to force Noriega out. Nothing worked. He refused to give himself up. But Martha had a plan, and it involved Vicky. I said, if you really want what's best for your country, and you certainly want what's best for your children, there's an opportunity here to cooperate with the US government, help us to get Noriega out of the Papal Nuncio. Now, we had established a direct line from the safe house to Noriega around the 27th of December so that they would initiate conversation. It was these conversations with Vicky and the trust built between these two women that gave Martha the idea that would lead to the capture of the general. And she saw me really as her savior. You know, I was the only person that she now was communicating with and had a sense that I was going to be able to help her. No guns, explosions, Navy SEALs. It all came down to that human emotion we're all vulnerable to that was to be General Noriega's downfall. Pride. He was a very, very proud man. He was not wanting to be humiliated you know, did not like anybody that would get in his way of thinking or things that the political side had also been trying to uh, dissuade him from getting involved in politics. That was not working. So he just was a man not to be trusted, but he felt that he was doing the right thing for the country. Martha had learned a lot about Noriega the man from Vicky. He had a big ego. He did not like to be humiliated. He always wanted to be dignified. So Martha had an idea, but she needed Vicky to persuade him. She set the bait. I had mentioned to Vicky that the sooner Noriega came out to tell him that things could work out in their future, you know, so it wasn't only just his pride, but perhaps some love in there. That's exactly how, how he exited the, the nuncio. Vicky makes the call. She said, being a very proud man, your dignity could be restored. You've been in there for a number of days and you could come out with your uniform, you know, your dignity restored. You can feel like you're a proud man coming out of the Papal Nuncio. And I think if you do this, we can start looking at what life may be down the road because it's now going to get better. The last call was around five o'clock on the 3rd of January, and the team had already started getting the preparations to get the uniform to Noriega, which is what then occurred. Martha's plan had worked. The uniform had been found, washed, pressed, and delivered to the embassy. 
at 8.44 p.m. on the 4th of January, 1990, Manuel Noriega walked out of the papal nuncio where he'd had the protection of the Vatican and into the hands of DEA officials. Martha and Vicky had achieved what all the might of the U.S. military could not. When I saw on the television that he was there, I mean, the cameras were right in his face, I just had the biggest grin. I just, you know, a lot of embracing. I was with my boss. It was very triumphant, elation. We did it, we did it, we did it. It was an incredible achievement. And I was just very happy at, at that moment. In the end, it had come down to one woman to bring in one of the most notorious military dictators in history. I think that was achieved because I was a woman there were parts to this operation that entailed getting close to a mistress that another man is not going to have the same opportunity. It would be very difficult for a man to do what, what I accomplished because the scenarios that I was able to orchestrate, being in a, in a hair salon, running up the causeway and flirting. You know, man is not able to get into those kinds of environments and achieve the kinds of things that, that I was able to achieve. Operationally, it just would not have happened. This is not the version of the capture of General Noriega you may have heard or read. Remarkably, in the official accounts by the generals and the heads of intelligence agencies, no one mentions Martha Duncan. She did get a certificate and an achievement medal, along with the rest of the members of the team. Now, she finally gets to tell her story. It's not like I was doing things completely on my own. You know, I, I had a boss that really relied upon my abilities, upon my capabilities, endorsed what I was going to do, gave me basically carte blanche to operate in the way that I did. My background, up to that point was instrumental in me achieving those things. And so getting credit for it, I, I just feel a sense of great pride. I've always, going back to my, my sporting life, you know, I was always a team player and I felt it's always about a team that gives support. I was the person in this time that led the team, but it was really a sense of, of great pride and achievement. Noriega was flown to the US with prisoner of war status to face charges of drug trafficking, money laundering, and racketeering. He spent 17 years in jail there. While in prison, he was convicted in absentia in France of money laundering. With agreement with the US, he was extradited to France in 2007. Panama also wanted him on murder charges, and again with agreement between the two countries, he was extradited to Panama in 2010. He died in jail in 2017, aged 83. My sense about Noriega, actually, it was still an open chapter until his death on 29 May of 2017. He had been sentenced in Miami to 40 years in jail. I also contributed some part to that because after he turned himself over, I requested to stay back and work with the document exploitation team, which sifted through troves and troves of papers that had been confiscated. And we looked for any information that could help in the trial that was then to precede him. So I always felt that, you know, finally justice has caught up with this evil man. And uh, when he was transferred from France to Panama, and he died in prison. And it's actually, the name of the prison is Renacer, which in English means a rebirth. <laughs> and I felt that very ironic because when he died, there really was a rebirth. And for me, it was closing of a chapter of Manuel Noriega. His mistress, Vicky Amado, swapped glamour and influence for quiet obscurity. Martha believes that she focused on raising her young daughter away from the glare of public opinion. Martha went back to her job without fanfare and quietly got back to work supporting clandestine operations. I returned from Panama 
the end of February. And uh, I had the opportunity to take some time off. I then went back to the operational world and clandestine world. And I had just a wonderful career with the operational element. And uh, I was able to retire from that organization in 2013. And I had my challenges. There's, uh, I think it's just a challenging environment to begin with for women. I uh, had a number of roadblocks along the way. But again, I got to a senior executive level because I had uh, those within the organization that, that had that, that trust and confidence in me. I'm Vanessa Kirby. Here's a taste of next week's high-stakes tangle with True Spies. <laughs> 